Sidebar is brought to you by Monterey College of Law, San Luis Obispo College of Law, Kern County College of Law, Empire College of Law located in Santa Rosa, and the Colleges of Law with campuses in Santa Barbara and Ventura. Welcome to Sidebar, discussions with local, state, and national experts about protecting our most critical individual and civil rights. Co-hosts, Law Dean's Jackie Gardena and Mitch Winnick. It's been disappointing to me to see people on both sides of the aisle really open to jailing their opponents because of their speech. Obviously, if you commit a crime, you commit a crime. If it's just you said something that I didn't like or that I think was wrong, I don't think that the default should be put them in prison. That scares me. That's today's guest, Jeff Kossoff, author of Liar in a Crowded Theater. Mitch, the First Amendment, the amendment that protects speech, religion, the press, and the right to assemble and petition the government, is the cornerstone of our democracy. And it's also a source of significant conflict today, especially around this idea of disinformation. What should we do when disinformation and misinformation is everywhere and political discourse demonizes groups of people and includes violent rhetoric? The question is, is it time to recalibrate our protection of speech, especially false speech? And I have to be honest, I struggle with this idea. Well, Jackie, these issues are exacerbated by the internet and the lack of attribution to digitally published sources and speakers. As if that isn't complicated enough, we're now faced with the challenges of artificial intelligence that raises yet another question. Is artificial computer-generated speech protected under the First Amendment? Luckily, and not surprisingly, Mitch and I have brought someone who has thought deeply about these questions. And I'm really hoping he can provide some insights and potential answers. Jeff Kossoff has had an impressive and varied career. He was an award-winning technology and political journalist for The Oregonian, an attorney who had practiced cybersecurity, privacy, and First Amendment law, and clerked for both the federal trial and appellate courts. And he is currently an associate professor of cybersecurity at the United States Naval Academy Cyber Science Department. It's not surprising, given his background, that he's the author of four books and more than 20 academic journal articles with a focus on the intersection of online speech and the First Amendment. His latest book, Liar in a Crowded Theater, Freedom of Speech in a World of Misinformation, will be available on October 24th. Jeff tackles a timely and incredibly difficult topic. Should lies be protected by the First Amendment, even when they have the potential to or do cause significant harm? We were lucky enough to get a sneak peek at his book to prepare for our conversation today, and the book is an exhaustive look at the history of the First Amendment, tells the evolution of the protection of speech, and provides a path forward. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. We have a lot of people who may not be educated in law. So I wanted to start with just a simple framing question. There's a lot of misconceptions about what the First Amendment protects or doesn't protect when it comes to speech. And even if you're a lawyer, if you aren't steeped in First Amendment law, you don't always understand the nuances. So before we dive into the substance of your book, I'm hoping we can lay out the basic protections. The First Amendment is not absolute. The government does regulate speech. Can you broadly describe speech that is protected and is not protected by the First Amendment? That's a great question. And I think that we could probably spend a full hour just talking about misconceptions about the First Amendment, including the fact that, and I think what's really important to note at the outset, is that the First Amendment only applies to the actions of the government. So if a private company on its own volition wants to take steps that might restrict speech as long as the government is not coercing or significantly encouraging it, then that's not going to be a First Amendment issue. In terms of what is protected, in the United States at least, the default analysis, at least sort of my framing from reading all the court opinions, is that speech is protected unless. And that unless is narrowly defined categories, things like obscenity, like defamation, if it meets the various common law and First Amendment standards, perjury, true threats, imminent incitement of lawless action. And 
if it's not within one of these narrow categories, then it's an incredibly high bar where you have to basically undergo strict scrutiny, which almost always <laughs> means that the regulation won't survive a First Amendment challenge. When you look at what is protected, I what I've increasingly like to do is look at the rest of the world and not just authoritarian countries like China and Russia, but even Western democracies like Europe. And for them, that's not the default. For them, there's a whole lot more speech that is not protected, and the government has much greater flexibility to regulate. So the United States, in many ways, is exceptionalist in its protections for a lot of speech that many people would find harmful. Why is it that the United States has taken this on a different path? What are the policies or, or ideas that undergird this, this concept of speech being free unless? There are different reasons. I think probably the largest theoretical framework that really you can see over the past century of Supreme Court decisions is this idea of the marketplace of ideas, which really was developed in 1919 in terms of jurisprudence earlier in philosophy and scholarship, but the idea that the best way to test the truth of speech is to put it on the open market, on the marketplace of ideas, and that the truth and also the other good speech will rise to the top and the free market will basically sort it out. And there are other reasons as well, and I go through many of them in the book, this sort of laissez-faire, really almost capitalist type of framing of free speech is what's really shaped the United States First Amendment doctrine. Now, there are other reasons such as self-governance, that if you allow the government to have too much control over speech, then the public will not be able to effectively participate in the democratic process because you'll have the people who are elected censoring. So there's a lot of different reasons, but I think those are the two primary drivers. Jeff, without digressing too far, I'm fascinated that you also specialize in cybersecurity, which means that you probably have access and information about far more frightening efforts to distort public news narrative through the distribution of intentionally false and deceptive social media, including AI-generated news. My question is, do we have a legal or constitutional handle on what type of digital communication qualifies for First Amendment protection? The Supreme Court has said repeatedly that the First Amendment does not vary based on technology. While that's not entirely true because you have broadcasters that can be regulated more heavily, but that's because the airwaves are scarce. Overall, the, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said for the internet, for example, we will apply the same First Amendment protections to the internet that we will provide to newspapers. I think that's the right way to go. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that? And I, I don't want to just derail this conversation about kind of the history and purpose of the First Amendment, but we now have AI-generated information. And I guess there's a question as to who is the protected speaker if it's AI generated. Does that change the nature of the first application of the First Amendment? I think that remains to be seen. I think we'll probably get answers to that in court opinions in the not too distant future. The Supreme Court has recognized a First Amendment right to receive information, even if you conclude nobody has any First Amendment interests in speaking through AI, there still would be some interest in receiving AI speech. So many directions to go with that answer that it's hard to choose. But I, I did want to get back to this idea of disinformation and the, the, the flood of disinformation that it feels like we're being subject to today. The title to your book is Liar in a Crowded Theater, and it's tied to one of those misconceptions about the First Amendment. Can you describe the origins of that statement and why you chose it as kind of the, the focus of your title? This actually was not the initial title of the book. I was writing about a cautionary tale about not over-regulating speech to deal with misinformation concerns. What I started to see in almost every case, both cases 50 years ago, as well as legislative proposals today, was that the person defending the increased liability or regulation of speech would say, well, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, so you also can't say X, Y, or Z. And 
almost always, if you looked at case law, you could say X, Y, or Z. It wasn't very pleasant. There were very rare cases where it actually would rise to the level of a true threat. I wanted to look at why do they say this? The origin of it came from a 1919 Supreme Court opinion where Oliver Wendell Holmes, he wrote in his opinion, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. That just took off because it ended up in the Supreme Court. But what fire in a crowded theater does is it basically gets rid of the century of very rigorous First Amendment analysis that the Supreme Court has developed and says, oh, well, we, we just can regulate whatever we think is bad because of fire in a crowded theater. And that's what's not true. We are going to take a brief break. When we come back, we continue our wide-ranging discussion with Jeff Kossif, author of Liar in a Crowded Theater, Freedom of Speech in a World of Misinformation. Jeff covers everything from what to do about elected officials spreading misinformation to disinformation on internet platforms and from stochastic terrorism and the rise of violence against marginalized groups. The Legal Technology Assessment, LTA, by ProCertis is a benchmark assessment and a training platform for law students and all legal professionals. Our online application establishes fluency within the most widely used tools of the trade. ProCertis is reshaping online learning. Come check us out at www.procertis.com. The Master of Arts in Law degree from the Colleges of Law was designed to empower working professionals to become innovative problem solvers in careers that intersect with the law. The legal field is more than what happens in a courtroom after all. The Colleges of Law. Learn more at collegesoflaw.edu. Kaplan helps thousands of law students become lawyers every year. Prepare to pass your bar exam with personalized prep that fits how you learn best. Choose from a traditional two-month course, a flexible three-month course, or semester-long prep. And get your personalized study plan, which includes thousands of realistic questions and unlimited essay grading. No one does bar review like Kaplan. Find the bar review that fits you best so you can score your best. Visit captest.com slash bar. That's K-A-P test.com slash bar. Let me stretch the metaphor a bit, just for a moment, and you can tell me if I'm completely off base. As you were describing the concept of true threat as a measure of whether you can regulate the speech, I thought of January 6th. You have a government official standing in front of tens of thousands of people with speech that at the end appears to have incited violence and danger. Is it a misapplication of a free speech doctrine that we address that scenario? Well, so I think the strongest argument for liability for speech related to January 6th would not be true threat. It would probably be imminent incitement of lawless action. But that that's a two-part test that the Supreme Court in the Brandenburg case, which at least narrowed this fire in a crowded theater opinion. It didn't eliminate it, but at least narrow the, the test. There both has to be an intent to incite imminent lawless action and a likelihood that it actually will incite that imminent lawless action. And I think that it depends on exactly what the scenario is. It's a very high bar. I talk in the book about some cases where the courts, including the Supreme Court, have said that bar wasn't met, but it can't be enough that you just get up on stage and say the election was stolen. That's protected speech. It might not be terribly wise speech. It, it, it might be dangerous speech, but it doesn't rise to that level of imminent incitement. I did want to follow up on something that Mitch was talking about. In the book, you do an excellent job of talking about and describing the dangers in giving the government the ability to decide what is true and what is false. And in part, because there's a continuum of statements, it might be an opinion, it might be simple hyperbole, it might be a misleading statement, but that's really due to a lack of context. It might be misinformation, which is inaccurate information, or it might be disinformation, which is intentional falsehoods intended to deceive. And I completely understand the Orwellian possibilities if the government was given the power to decide what is true and what is false. What should we do when it was 
the government or at least leaders within the government disseminating arguably false information. Don't vote for them. The democratic system works. If they lie to you, you can vote them out of office. Catherine Ross at GW, she published a book, I think it was two years ago, called The Right to Lie. Her argument is that the president owes a certain duty to the public to not lie to them intentionally. But I think that we get into dangerous territory when the proposals include things like jailing politicians for lying it's really hard not to push back. So I find that to be a dissatisfying answer. Logically, I understand it, but emotionally, I don't. I want to turn to some of what's happening. We know that there are criminal prosecutions going on right now for statements made and actions taken around the 2020 election. We know that Donald Trump is currently in trial right now on this day for fraud and misstatements or inaccurate statements he made on financial. You can be penalized and the government does penalize you for disinformation. So it's not just elections that solve this problem. Well, absolutely. And I think fraud is one of the well-established existing exceptions to the First Amendment protections. And I think it should be. And I think if someone, just like if someone perjures themselves, they can't claim the First Amendment. Or if someone imminently incites lawless action, if, regardless of whether it's true or false, you could face liability. The problem is some of these proposals have been any false statement about election administration. That is open to so much abuse. That's the sort of thing that I think, no, we, we cannot get there. But if someone lies and commits fraud, I mean, they perjure themselves if they lie to a federal agent, there have been numerous prosecutions for that. That's fine. Here's where I, I guess I have a question about that. And I think it comes from a bias as an attorney or someone who is an officer of the court. We accept that attorneys can be penalized for a lack of candor to the court. We accept that individuals can be jailed and penalized for perjury because it undermines the administration of justice. Why don't we think undermining the administration of elections or democracy is as important and needing the same kind of protections as the administration of justice within our court systems. So for attorneys, and Rudy Giuliani is facing this right now with a number of different proceedings, is you, you can lose your bar license. And for politicians, you could, and, and that's because it's a professional standard. I mean, the attorney regulations are not that you go to prison. And I think that's the same for politicians in that you don't get reelected or you're impeached or removed from office if you meet a rigorous standard. I think what crosses the line, for me at least, is going outside of the professional obligations and saying, if you say the wrong thing, we're putting you in prison. That's banana republic talk. It's been disappointing to me to see people on both sides of the aisle really open to jailing their opponents because of their speech. I think that's obviously if you commit a crime, you commit a crime. But if, if it's just you said something that I didn't like or that I think was wrong, I don't think that the default should be put them in prison. That scares me. Jeff, let me go back to something you talked about a little earlier, which is you made the comment as a reminder that the First Amendment regulates the government's restriction of free speech, but not private speech or private publications. I question that to the extent that the government does place some restrictions, as you've said, on television and radio, because there's a public benefit there that gets regulated. And yet, thanks to Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, we don't seem to be able to place any of the same regulations on the internet to have some type of both protection of free speech, but also some type of protection against intentional disinformation. Where are we going in that direction? Before you answer, let me give some context about the law. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act relieves platforms like Facebook and TikTok from liability for what is posted on the platform. Section 230 doesn't protect the person who's disseminating it. 
that person is always going to be liable. What Section 230 does is it says the burden in almost always civil cases will fall on the person who said the illegal speech, not on the platform. It's not that speech on the internet is entirely outside of the scope of the law. I think that's been one of the misunderstandings of Section 230. It's just Section 230 really is about shifting the legal burden from the platform to the speaker because the platforms most likely, and for better or worse, the platforms would be far more reluctant to carry a lot of speech. There are a lot of platforms, not the big tech companies, but like a local newspaper that might just say, we're not going to allow user comments because we don't want to spend $50,000 doing preliminary motions in a defamation lawsuit. So it's just going to be easier not to have user comments. So that's really what 230 does. I think one of the things we took for granted or may have been taking for granted is the existence of editorial control in TV, radio, newspaper that completely doesn't exist on the digital media when Section 230 gives an exemption to the platform itself. The reality is we rarely know who the speakers are or who the originators are of the language. There is no editor that checks it. They just get to wash, they being the platforms, get to wash their hands of any liability of establishing whether there's any danger, truth, whatever, related to that language. It really flies in the face of this idea that let the market decide what's valuable, truthful, or useful, but that doesn't seem to be the way it's playing out. So I, I don't have an answer, but I'm interested in what your thinking is on that. I think that Section 230 does not lead to platforms just washing their hands of editorial control. I think for those of us who have spent a lot of time looking at what platforms do with user content, to varying degrees, they're actually incredibly active in moderating content. I mean, the criticism that a lot of the platforms get is they're too active in moderating content, and that's what they're getting sued for now all over the place. The stuff that you see on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok is not just this unfiltered feed. Anyone who's sat with content moderators know that they see the worst of the worst of humanity, and so much is blocked by human as well as AI moderation. And they don't do a perfect job. They make a lot of mistakes, and in part because there's no perfect job, because two people could be looking at the same decision and one person could say it was great, the other person could say that they made the wrong decision. I I would push back on the fact that the platforms are not engaging in editorial control, and to the point of not knowing who the speaker is. This gets back to my previous book about anonymity, which is that I mean, our country has a long tradition of anonymous speech going back to Common Sense and the Federalist Papers and found, I mean, almost everything that was important that was written at the time of our founding was written under a pseudonym or just anonymously. The United States is one of the few countries that really rigorously protects a free speech right to be anonymous because of those values. I've spent a lot of time over the past few years pushing back on people who want to impose real name registration requirements on the internet. For me, for example, that would be fine. I am a tenured professor who has a lot of freedom to speak. So if I had to speak everything under my real name on the internet, I have the luxury of being able to do that. There's a whole lot of people in marginalized groups, people whose jobs are at stake, who can only speak anonymously. And those protections are really vital. So let me go one step further on that because I understand and respect that. Does your argument, and this is putting your cybersecurity hat on, does your argument change at all when the concern is that it's speech from a foreign government? Because one of the differences between the traditional publication of newspapers and even television and radio is now the internet is global. So the sources of this information can be foreign agents and foreign governments who are trying to disrupt our elections and disrupt the news flow. Does that change this dynamic? It doesn't because there still, again, gets back to this right to receive information. We're not going to give foreign governments a First Amendment right. I mean, the Supreme Court has recognized and lower courts have recognized a right to receive information. There's a good reason for that because Again, you look at the efficacy of how it actually operates, and if you have the U.S. government saying, 
you can't get any any information from foreign countries because we don't trust them. That's so susceptible to abuse. I think that's why it's not really seriously on the table. Jeff, when we started this conversation before the interview actually began, I told you that this was going to be part therapy, part legal discussion for me. This is, I think, a question where it's where my emotions in some way overcome or interfere with the logic that you bring into the book. So we took a group of students to Berlin to look at criminal justice reform. And as part of that trip, we went to the Topography of Terror, which was a museum and a learning center for the rise of Nazi party and just how things unfolded at that point in time in Germany. And we looked closely at how the Nazi party had used criminal laws to demonize groups of people and to suppress dissent. And it's one of the reasons why we hold so dear to our First Amendment, because we don't want the government suppressing dissent through criminalizing it. And you've talked a lot about that. But we also saw how the Nazi party used propaganda and stochastic terrorism, which is the public demonization of a person or group that results in the incitement of violence against them. And Nazi Germany, obviously, it was a government-sanctioned violence against a group of people. And we're seeing some of those same actions emerge in the U.S. States are criminalizing certain conduct and behavior. They're actually criminalizing librarians who allow certain books in the library or teachers who teach certain curriculum in the classroom. Members of the LGBT community, which I identify as one, and anyone who supports them are called groomers and deemed to be putting children at risk. And the government rhetoric demonizing migrants, the black and brown community, the Jewish community, the LGBT community is frightening. I'm glad that you raised book banning and all of the other trends that we're seeing, especially in states like Florida, but really all over the country. I think those are equally bad. I think the issue is that so often when I'm engaging in these discussions about free speech, I find people who want to pick and choose which speech restrictions are okay. And we can't do that. We have to take the good and the bad. I'm terribly concerned about what's going on in many of these states. I like to point out to people who often are at the same time trying to say, let's put people in prison because they questioned election results that or require platforms to take down any content that questions the COVID vaccine. Our country, for good reason, has never made these choices, these policy preferences for who gets free speech protections. It's not workable. I'd like to see everyone easing up. And I realize the contradiction <laughs> In my sentence where I'm talking about book banning at the same time, wanting to be more aggressive with people who are demonizing certain groups of citizens, it's so hard for me not to see value in one set of speech, whereas an, a, another set of speech lacks value. And therein lies the problem that we're discussing is who gets to decide what's valuable and not valuable, who gets to have the power to do that. It is hard to listen to the rhetoric right now and not want there to be something other than social consequences or political consequences. Because in our gerrymandered state houses, it's almost impossible to have political consequences occur in the way that we think about it. Even with the presidential elections, with the Electoral College, it's hard to see the political consequences playing out as we imagine in an idealized world. I get the political consequences thing. I find it very dissatisfying. The history of free speech globally over time has been when you roll back protections, it's really hard to get them back. When we return from this brief break, our guest, Jeff Kossif, author of Liar in a Crowded Theater, offers his insights on how to counter the spread of misinformation without actually trampling on free speech rights. And then Mitch and I provide some closing thoughts. Jackie and I would like to take a quick minute to recommend a great podcast. An Honorable Profession profiles the rising stars in American politics. From mayors to attorney generals, An Honorable Profession gives listeners a view from the front lines of our democracy. Check out An Honorable Profession wherever podcasts are found. San Luis Obispo College of Law offers on-site and hybrid online evening classes that provide you the option to continue working while attending law school. 
To learn more about their accredited degree programs or to apply for their next term, go to slowlaw.org. That's S-L-O law.org. Your community, your law school, your future. Welcome to the future of legal intelligence. Trellis, a state trial court research and analytics solution. Trellis offers state trial court records for legal research with analysis on judges, opposing counsel, verdicts, motions, dockets, and legal issues. Visit our website, trellis.law. So, Jeff, one of the things that other guests on our show have said is that the answer to hate speech is more speech, not less speech. Is that too overly simplistic to what you're trying to set as a message to us? Part of it is more speech. In the third part of my book, I go through different ways to deal with misinformation that are outside of regulation. Another big part of it is better educating people. When I say education, it's not telling people what is true and what is false. That's never going to work, and that that actually is a bit too ministry of truthy for me. I think giving people tools to better question what they see on the internet, I don't think we really do that very well. Jeff, Jackie, and I like to wrap up each episode by asking our guest kind of the more hopeful view of the future. So you've given us a couple of examples right there, and your book does even more, so we highly encourage folks to to get your book. What else can we do as individuals? We're listening to this show and someone says, okay, what should I start doing now that would improve this situation and, and perhaps put what Jackie is concerned about is this lack of balance in responsible speech. I think individuals could play a big role in what I was just talking about, which is better educating themselves as to how to evaluate what they see on the internet and just stopping and slowing down a little bit, not immediately believing some random account they see on Instagram, but instead saying, okay, well, I'm going to look and see, is, is this actually something that is true or is it something that maybe was twisted a bit? And I, I think if everyone could slow down a little bit, which I know is really hard because there's a new story every minute, that really is what would give me the most hope if people empowered themselves. Because ultimately, the government's not going to save us. It's going to be in the hands of individuals. I think that's a perfect place to end. Jeff, thank you for joining us today. Your new book, Liar in a Crowded Theater, is thought-provoking. An important reminder about the importance of protecting all speech, even the speech we don't like. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. We really appreciate having you. Sure thing. Jackie, this was a fascinating conversation. I must say I both love it and hate it. On one half of my brain, I'm saying I'm a believer in free speech, period. And I do believe in what Jeff said. Let the market decide. Let the listener decide. Give some credit to the audience to choose what they hear and what they believe. On the other hand, I must say I am far more concerned than he is about the direction that misinformation, intentional distortion, and what's become known as fake news is having particularly on our election cycle. I don't believe we can turn a blind eye to it. I guess if you're willing to say the world works in decades, not months, then you can sit back and relax and say, we will survive this and cycle back into democracy. But I'm not convinced. I had the exact same reaction. I think there are two things. When you read the book, and I do encourage people to read it, at the end, he talks about alternatives to restricting speech. And he talked about some of them at the end of the podcast, civics education, media literacy, counter speech, which is that idea of good speech will rise to the top. We can argue about whether or not that's the case. I think what concerns me about those methods is that civics education and media literacy in elementary school and high school is a long-term project. I mean, we're at a point right now where we can't have a national conversation about what should be taught in schools without it becoming embroiled in politics. 
we're having conversations now about whether or not it's okay to teach about slavery in the same way or, or have certain conversations in the classroom. So agreeing on media literacy or a particular civics education, it's not just a long-term project. It seems like it would be difficult right now to get to a place where we could agree upon that. I think the other thing that gave me pause in his book, he talks about the government can help by building back trust. That's an inherent problem when we're talking about disinformation, because some of the disinformation that is out there is about our government and whether or not it can be trusted. So for the government to build up trust, it needs to break through the disinformation or the misinformation or the hyperbole about the dangers of government. I liked logically the idea like you about the protection of speech. I appreciated the alternatives to restricting speech, but like you, I'm worried about what feels like the speed at which this is accelerating right now in the United States. I agree. I, it doesn't surprise me so many times you and I have the same reaction to these things. I would take his caution seriously, which, which I believe we all should give thought to, which is once you start taking away freedoms, those freedoms are regulated as the political winds change. And we may feel security in having restricted freedoms now if one happens to agree with the current administration. He's correct. You have to project forward and say, what will the restriction of those freedoms look like if it's a different administration that an individual doesn't agree with? And your reference to Nazi Germany is a historical wake-up call once you start taking constitutional and individual and civil rights away and put it in the hands of the government, bad things have happened. It's not just that they do happen, they have happened. As many of our topics end, I have differing opinions. I have some concerns on both sides, but most of all, it's been a very thoughtful conversation that I think is helpful. Mitch, you and I could probably continue talking about this both with Jeff and with each other for the next hour, but we're going to have to end there. Thanks to Jeff for such a thought-provoking conversation and one that I'll carry into the school, as I'm sure you will as well. Once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us today on Sidebar. And as always, Mitch and I would love to know what's on your mind. You can reach us at sidebarmedia.org. Sidebar would not be possible without our producer, David Eakin, who also composes and performs all of the Sidebar music. Thank you also to Go Go Zoger, who manages Sidebar's marketing and social media. Colleges of Law and Monterey College of Law are part of a larger organization called California Accredited Law Schools. All of our schools are dedicated to providing access and opportunity to a legal education to marginalized communities. For more information about the California Accredited Law Schools, go to calawschools.org. That's calawschools.org.